Welcome back to the P2 Arrow channel. Today I'm going to mix things up a bit. This video is somewhat inspired by some recent interaction I've had on my social media account regarding wire gauge and sizing things for a desired amp flow. Like always, I'm not an expert on any of this, but I do enjoy sharing what I've learned over the years of being exposed to both military and civilian aviation maintenance. I'm humbled by the fact that I have much to learn and I enjoy the dialogue created by these videos, so keep it up and let me know what you're thinking in the comments below. There are so many videos out there on this subject, but for my target audience, I thought a practical application of these theories was needed. For this example, I'll be determining the wire size I need to power my Dynon SV42 autopilot servos. I'll be referencing both the Dynon installation manual as well as the FAA AC4313 1B, specifically figures 11.2 and 11.3. Anyone building an airplane out there should be familiar with this document, but if you're not, it's full of what's considered standard procedure for all things related to building and maintaining aircraft. First, let's figure out what wire we want to use. For this decision, it's important to consider the environment in which it will be living. What kind of temperatures will it see? Is it exposed to moisture, dirt, chemicals, or UV? Will I be routing this wire in a bundle, or is the wire out in the open all by itself? Note that you won't find any reference to wire available down at your local auto parts store in the 4313. That's not to say it wouldn't work for you. It's just that in most cases the testing hasn't been performed on that wire. And so making decisions is difficult when you don't know the limitations of the wire you have. You'll find that most installations out there use a mil spec wire 22759-16. And I personally use this for everything I can. It's a TEF cell coated wire with a tin plating on the conductor to help it not oxidize over time. It's flexible to work with and accepts crimp and solder connections well. It's rated up to 600 volts and the TEF cell can withstand temps of 150 C, 300 degrees Fahrenheit. It's also the wire that most of the charts in the 4313 are based on. So here's a list of things I consider when designing my installations. What's the distance involved? Is it using an airframe ground or do I have a ground wire running back to the ground bus? What are the amp requirements for the component needing the power? Is it a continuous or intermittent load? Will it be in a harness or by itself? What voltage loss and conductor temps are involved? So let's figure all that out for this servo. For my installation, the servo is four foot from the power source. It does have a ground wire and my ground bus is also four feet away. So that gives me a total run of eight feet. The Dynon installation manual recommends a five amp breaker for this servo I wouldn't consider an autopilot servo a continuous load, however it's considered a best practice to do calculations based on it being so if there's any doubt. We'll look at both just to compare the differences out of curiosity. This wire will be routed with other wires in a bundle along the edge of my fuselage up behind the instrument panel. As for amp loss and conductor temps, the FAA bases their charts on a 0.5 volt drop for a 14 volt circuit for continuous amp demand. That computes out to about 3.57% total drop, and they consider anything more than this to be an excessive drop. They also base all these charts on a 20C or a 70 degree Fahrenheit conductor temp. This is really just a median and a baseline figure. The 4313 does outline the formulas involved in calculating these charts for other voltage drops or temperature ranges, but generally, using their charts is considered a good, conservative calculation. Looking at figure 11.2, the continuous load chart. You'll see amperage along the top and the right side, common voltage levels with calculated voltage drop along the left, and wire gauge along the bottom. For our example, we know I need 5 amps, so I'll highlight that diagonal line for reference. We also know that we need 8 feet of length, so from the 8 in the 14 volt column, I'll draw a horizontal line out from there until it intersects with the diagonal line for 5 amps. From that intersection, go straight down to the bottom and we end up in between 22 and 20 gauge wire. If you're unfamiliar with wire gauges, it actually gets bigger as the gauge number decreases. It seems backwards, but the original system of gauging wires started with a zero gauge or one aught in today's terminology. They would then pull that through an extrusion once to stretch it out and then you would have one gauge. Likewise, 20 times through the machine gave us a much smaller 20 gauge wire. Anytime you land in between gauges on this chart, you move to the right to the next size up as moving left would be a smaller wire than what you're specking out even though the gauge number is larger. 
Let's swing over to figure 11.3 and see what an intermittent load looks like. Doing the same thing as before, you'll see that it's saying I could use a 22 gauge wire for this run. So let's take a look at the pre-designed harness Dynon has for the autopilot servo. We'll see how it stacks up to our calculations. All wires in this harness are MIL W22759-16-20. This is a Tefcel 10 plated 20 gauge copper wire. Jumping back to figure 11.3, let's see how long of a run this could be using 20 gauge wire. So at 20 feet, we know this wire would maintain a temperature of 20 C or 70 degrees Fahrenheit or less. Knowing it can handle 150 C or 300 degrees Fahrenheit gives us the satisfaction that placing it in a harness where heat dissipation is limited or using it in an engine bay where it's exposed to higher temps and even stretching things out further than 20 feet are all doable things if needed. I think we'll wrap things up here so I hope this was useful to some of you out there. Just remember to do your research because understanding why these limitations are in place will only allow a better, safer outcome for your project. If I misspoke or you feel this presentation was in some way misleading, I'd love to hear from you in the comments below as we can all probably learn from the dialogue. Again, I'm no expert and this is only a representation of how I go about sizing a wire for a specific load. Thanks for watching and I'll see you on the next episode.